good morning. Uh, or when I say good morning, it could be, I don't know what time it is where you're listening. It's 4am here. It's pitch black outside. I'm in Dublin, Ireland in September, the start of September. I, I tried to record this intro yesterday, but uh, I couldn't because my neighbour had a chainsaw and a hedge that needed cutting. So here we are. It's all good though. I love doing this. So yeah, um, I hope you're you're keeping well. I've got some news. I have a new sponsor, The Nature of Things. That's what they're called. Beautifully crafted essential oils. Um, I don't know if you remember, but if you follow me on Instagram, back in February, I met with their founder, Benoit Nicole, in the chocolate factory, which they don't actually make chocolate in the chocolate factory. It's just it's an old chocolate factory that they've converted. It's in, it's in Dublin, city centre. And Benoit has spent 20 years working with some of the best oil producers and the best perfumers to now establish his own offering. He does essential oils straight from nature. Uh, no nasties, no funny stuff, just pure oil. My favorite is geranium, believe it or not, because it's, it's like fruity and it's minty at the same time. And in the morning times, I sprinkle a few drops into my diffuser before I practice. Uh, I also like to put a little bit on, a bit of lavender before I go to bed. Um, yeah, make, it makes a big difference, you know. So if you'd like some oils and a diffuser or even if to treat your friend to a gift set, you can visit the nature of things, die, fill your basket and use the promo code yoga life for 10% off all products. That's promo code yoga life, one word for 10% off all products. And this offer is valid from September 1st to October 31st, one use per customer only. The other sponsor I have are Small Changes. Small Changes, I've been with these guys for a while now, shop there twice a week, and uh, organic, eco-friendly, whole food store where you can get more than just food. You can get your refills, they have a juice bar, they have a zero waste ethos, and uh, they're open in Drum Condra, Dublin 9. They are soon to be open here in, north, in further north in Dublin, but it uh, looks like that's going to be next year, perhaps 2020. God, 2020, that's crazy to say that. Um, yeah, let me do a little bit of housekeeping before I launch into our guest. Um, so the only thing I have at the moment is the workshop in Sligo, because everything else is sold out. You can join the waitlist for Dan Morgan. That's this Saturday. And, you know, join the waitlist and we'll sneak you in. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That's in Yoga Hub, Camden Street. It's a free event. And the workshop in Sligo is in Salt and Soul in December 14th. So that's going to be in Sligo. Um, it's, you, you've got to pay for that one. <laughs> but you can make a little weekend of it. Go out to Sligo. I was there uh, last month and um, you know, went into the sea, went and had some nice seafood. Yeah, it was, it was cool. Um, so yeah, all information can be found on kevinboyyoga.ie. Uh, if you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes. I've got like 74 five-star reviews now, which is amazing. Thanks so much. It's, it's brilliant. I, I Sometimes when I'm feeling down, I like read my reviews. <laughs> I know. Yes, I do require external validation. And um, yeah, and if you enjoy it as well, please share it with your friends on your IG stories. So today, my guest is Andy Myers. He is the owner, the head coach, and the manager of the Movement Studio based here in Dublin, Ireland. That's in South Dublin in Terenure. And essentially, these guys practically invented the whole handstand coffee craze. And uh, they've got a really big community down there and a loyal, I wasn't say fan base, but it's its more than that. It's, um, yeah, they've carved out their own community and uh, they're doing really interesting things with movement. And, and I just, I really like what they're doing. So this is why I brought Andy on. So that's enough rambling for me. Without further ado, here's Andy. <laughs> This is actually distilled water. Mm-hmm. Mm. Cheers. Well, cheers. You notice the difference? Yeah. Yeah. That's reverse osmosis? That's distilled. Distilled. So what's the difference? Difference is, um, 
we've started, by the way. So the difference, <laughs> I'm glad you asked this question because <laughs> I am the authority. Um, difference between well, distilled water, and I said I was going to talk about this in a previous podcast, even though it's probably not a very interesting topic, but I find it interesting, mm -hmm. is that it steams the water. So it's like a big kettle. Okay. It steams the water and then it catches the water at the top and then it drips out into a big container. So all the heavy metals are kept at the bottom. Whereas reverse osmosis puts it through a number of filters and the advantage of reverse osmosis is that it takes out fluoride. Okay. Whereas distill distillation doesn't take out fluoride. But when you use a filter system, loads of bacteria collects in, in the filters themselves. Okay. So, and plus it's really expensive to replace the filters, whereas distillation is, is so cheap. It's like, I got a thing for 120 quid. Okay, well, what's it like time wise? Um, four liters, three hours. Three hours, okay. And you could leave it overnight then, or? Yeah, it turns itself off when it's done. Cool. So I just have it on the go constantly. I'll have to get that. So, yeah. so Andy, as, as my first person, my first guest who sampled the distilled water, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Yeah, amazing. It was really interesting. Um, <laughs> Colin Harmon, who run, oh sorry, microphone. Uh, Colin Harmon, who runs Tree Fee, oh, he yeah. only had a post yesterday as a reminder of when he did. Um, it was like a water tasting. Mm -hmm. So he was in, I think he was in college for innovation. Like he went back to college to do innovation and business and stuff like that. And then Tree Fee, then he had this uh, water tasting thing, which is like five euro for. I think it was around five euro for like f I think it was four types of water, and the whole purpose was to show because, you know, in specialty coffee, basically. Um, Mm -hmm. taste is important and the experience is important and all that and it's a bit different now I think because everywhere is doing specialty coffee the innovative side of things is not necessarily highlighted because it's it's almost specialty as standard which I think is, is an important thing in general but anyway um, he had a reminder up just of back when he did that it was like five euro for four different types of water and one was like distilled and one was bottled water and one had came from like you know uh, water from the filter system in the the cafe or whatever and so it was a water drinking experience just to see wow like how different could this water taste mm. uh, i think he got a lot of flack for it and it kind of bombed and people were like oh you're charging five euro for three little sips of water <laughs> but the whole point was like it was quite innovative innovative to try and highlight that because mm -hmm. if you're in something like um coffee or wine or whatever all these subtleties are quite important or whatever so yeah. there's something like the distilled water even outside of a health um view of getting rid of the heavy metals and whatever uh just interesting taste wise as well to see when all the impurities are taken out how yeah. it is. so it's quite I cool mean, i mean i could tell by your face expression you notice the difference in the yeah. taste of the water um but if i look at the the machine when it's done it's it's like there's gunk at the bottom now I, i'm talking after a week i've had it for just over a week now mm -hmm. and so that would have been in your, our body and uh, and I think that I, I don't know what the correlation is between cancer and all these uh, um, Parkinson's or whatever diseases mm -hmm. that we seem to be modern diseases but surely the water that we drink in lime scale is is um, you know needs to be addressed um, what you know uh, so I want to go into food actually since we're talking about water what have you got any like are you, are you a vegan no. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm not either, but I used to be. Mm -hmm. And um, do, have you got any like um, diet protocol that you fo follow? No, not at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> interestingly no? enough, interestingly enough, and honestly, I'm coming out of a period of like my daughter's tree now. I think we found the initial years of parenting quite hard and quite stressful, um, and I think a lot of stuff kind of fell by the wayside. So my nutrition. I've always been had a weird relationship with nutrition anyway. Um, I like food, I like eating stuff, I like having a very diet, <laughs> for want of a better term. <laughs> but yeah, over the last kind of two, three years, I would have been a little bit heavier than I would, should have been, um, or would like to be, a little bit less healthy than I'd like to be. Um, and that's down to kind of just diet and even, you know, more wine than is kind of more wine. normal. Yeah, so just drinking wine every night. And just looking back on it now, because I'm in a lovely place the last while. Um, like I'm down about a stone off the weight I went away going to holidays and stuff like that and yeah everything is lovely moving well and all that mm. um, but yeah so nutrition was I I think I typically would go through stages um, cycles if you want throughout the year mm. um, uh, I like to eat well and I absolutely feel the benefits uh, and I definitely feel the the slump when I don't mm -hmm. I know trigger foods can like like something could put me into a really bad day so i avoid that stuff um absolutely yeah um but just in general uh, a healthy me is is quite 80 20 about things mm -hmm. so like yeah no major things um but i eat generally well and look after myself in general and if i don't um it's generally if the stresses are high and i think i've gone through all that sort of stuff now like i'll be 38 in a couple of months 
uh, just learning about all that sort of stuff where mm. yeah just it's a nice time to be talking to you because everything is just smooth and nice that's good man. yeah because i was chatting to um suzanne who was she works for the yoga hub ah. she she runs the place basically long yeah, hair long yeah. hair I'm married two weeks ago amazing <laughs> hair yeah so um she'll be listening to this because i mentioned i was meeting you and then she said oh andy Oh, I love Andy. He's so nice. And he moves, she's going to hate me for saying this, but, and he moves like a dancer. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously that's, that's your thing. You know, your studio is called the movement studio. Yeah. So therefore it's, as you said, you've got to live life. You know, mm-hmm. you have, you have your 20% where you're being a bit naughty, but, it, but it is, um, how you eat it, I'm sure affects performance. Um, I want to actually talk about the word movement, mm-hmm. right? Because if someone's listening, someone's listening to this might be thinking, you got the gym. I go to the gym. I lift weights to get big muscles and to to look good, as it were. Or I go to yoga to relax. But if you say to someone, "I have a movement studio," to the to the person who's not doesn't know the concept, they could say, "Well, I move when I walk to the fridge." Mm-hmm. So what what is like w- why? Move, move my studio. Why? Yes, <laughs> that's, good, that's a good question. <laughs> okay, so Not the, great grammar, the but... quick and dirty answer would be: I would pretty much say it should be called the People Studio. Uh-huh. And so what that comes down to is, to me, movement is subjective. Yeah. And so our job is to be able to help each person through the door as much as possible. And we can only do that if we have a big spectrum of coaching ability, a big spectrum of understanding people, uh, the empathy to know who needs what to know how to know who needs to be talked to a certain way, what they need to do, what they want. The framework of programming, when Johnny comes in and Mary comes in and whoever comes in, be like, okay, well, this is what we're doing, but it's only a framework. Most of the good stuff will happen through conversation. I mm-hmm. saying, if you ask me, why are you doing this? I'll say, well, here's why we're doing it, but what do you need? And what does it mean to you? And if we do it this way, does it make sense to you? That could be rep scheme changes, sets, uh, could be intensity, it could be tension for one person, relaxation for another person. Could be a million different things. So movement to me is not movement culture. If it was to be anything, it would be back to the fundamentals of human movement, which is just how we move. So some something as simple as locomoting, like someone who could um, punch with the right hand as they step forward with the left foot. And so that general, just normal, natural, rotational capacity where some people can't even do that, like Mm -hmm. um, if they're thinking about it or whatever. Um, So when I think about movement, I think about it as having the experience and know how to look after each person and knowing what's actually important about that. And then for a lot of people, like the movement culture stuff is too fancy and unnecessary. So, um, but again, going through years of kind of just learning that myself. Uh, Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm back into a phase now where martial arts is a huge influence on what I'm doing and now I'm seeing it through the eyes of a movement person in inverted in commas um, because I'm like wow like all this complex stuff and all this like even isolated stretch and all that if we just actually moved well which you can learn through kicking and punching and throwing and interacting you know all this sort of stuff mm-hmm. we can look at, at everything through the lens of simple human movement and then build it from there you mm-hmm. really can um, so I think it's, it's a lovely a lovely way to come around full circle where I started out from martial arts and then gone through all this other stuff from handstanding to whatever it may be, like back bend and, you know, just all the, the fancy stuff again, back in inverted commas to realise that actually they're all just larger expressions of what we should all be capable of. So stuff like thoracic rotation, extension, flexion of the shoulders, mm-hmm. extension of the hips, you know, mm-hmm. uh, healthy feet, uh, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So why movement? <laughs> movement always allowed me to bridge the gap between what's CrossFit, what's yoga, uh, what's Pilates, uh, what's fitness, uh, what's... L- not mocking fitness but what's if you take fitness out of the equation because it's quite a toxic world bring it back to the person and then build it back up again basically movement is what's common between all of those things and it'll always come back to the human first and then how they move second and then i suppose how we'll interact and make that happen or bring that out of the person Mm -hmm. um so that's movement (laughs) so what what was what was your what's your background specifically related to movement like what did you do when you were younger what discipline sports did you like or practice yeah so i think it's always easier to say looking back but like movement to me was always the the social thing looking back at it it was like i loved playing with people and interacting with people and feeling like i was good on a basketball court versus you know five other people the other team or whatever uh or playing football i could express myself so if you're playing a game of crossbars it's like well okay maybe if i could step five yards back i can hit the crossbar from here i'll feel good about that so it was always about that it was about expression uh, about your place amongst your friends uh, healthy competition um 
all that sort of stuff. So yeah, uh, football, basketball, um, mm. generally kind of active as a kid, <laughs> hyper. Um, even in computer games, stuff like that when I was younger, I just had this knack of wanting to just do better and to find out all the little tricks and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, I think football, basketball, growing up mostly, then when I got out of basketball, it was mostly because it was a very egotistical sport. It's always not about just beating to the person, but like really rubbing it in their face and stuff like that. So that's when I started to grow up and get my own voices like, no, nah, that's definitely not for me. I'm not really that person. Mm. Um, just growing into that. And then as I got out of basketball, I got into martial arts. Um, what age you when you started martial arts? I think I'm 24, so late enough. And what kind? Um, uh, it was initially Bushido, so kind of points kickboxing, just a real snippy snappy, like in, touch, get your score and back out again. Mm -hmm. uh, it was okay at that, not amazing, but I travelled uh, you know, around and did a few fights and all that, and it gave me a bit of confidence to even be on what is essentially a stage in front of people, like, you know, fighting in front of a crowd or whatever. Um, so that really brought me on Michelle because I was much, uh, much shyer when I was younger. Uh, and then I got into full contact, which I absolutely adored, and that really taught me how to be tough, um, or brought out my toughness. I didn't realize how strong or tough I was up until I was like, wow, like looking at the people I was fighting, I could have swore they were like five or six inches taller than me and much bigger. And then you realize, actually, you know, these people are the same size as me. Um, yeah, I think my background was like, I was really, really short until I was like 17, and then I was like 17 and a half, I took a growth spurt. Mm. Um, yeah, so all these kind of things just kind of led to bringing me out Michelle or whatever like that and the full contact kickboxing was one of those things where a lot of experience a lot of hard lessons like injuries uh, but ultimately like having moments where you're like I've just become I've come from being this really shy person into walking into a, a hall in Galway against the local hero and just feeling like I have my place here and mm -hmm. you know it was a grounded and this is me now mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that was just real transformative so that's the general spectrum is kind of sports up until that and a bit of gymnastic stuff then after all the kickboxing injuries kind of made me choose something a bit more different <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, jiu jitsu did you practice that at all uh, yeah oh, I was only talking to one of the lads the other day about this uh, jiu jitsu I did three years ago I joined East Coast for a three month period this is off the back of becoming a parent as well and wanting to, to get back moving again and having space and all that uh, at the time time wise stress wise just w was not working like and I loved it um, and I always figured I'd get back into it at some stage and it would be something I'd do for life and then we put well, I bought mats in the studio so we'd kind of roll every Sunday with the lads and stuff like that and then some of the lads wouldn't make it one week and all that and then you know just the general stuff that happens is like you lose a week or two and it's like eh yeah. and you know yourself in jujitsu uh, if you lose a couple of classes or a, a week you're just like, like being back at Square one again. That's so true. People get people advance so quick that you, yeah, you miss a week, and the people that you were tapping before are tapping you. It's yeah. Like, what the hell? Yeah. Um. So yeah, when I was chatting to a friend of mine this week, he was like, "Are you doing jujitsu again?" Because I hadn't seen him for two years. He went to Canada. Um. I was like, you know what? I said, I can't. It's not because I wouldn't be able to do it properly, and I won't dedicate my life to it. And I don't think if you're doing, if you're not dedicating your life to doing jujitsu, because it's something that's on your brain twenty four seven. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, just kind of saying goodbye to jiu-jitsu and being like no i love it i'm and you know what i'm a stand-up guy at heart so hitting the bag now is kind of my passion and getting mm -hmm. back doing that so yeah yeah, oh. <laughs> I, I yeah but it, it's it's i think with jiu-jitsu it i mean i have three kimonos i have all my nogi stuff mm -hmm. um if the people who don't know what i'm talking about that's like i have all the the clothing essentially um that cost me a fair few bob, you know, getting kimonos, especially you've got a few of them. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I competed a couple of times and I I think I probably will get back into it because it's such, it is, it's so, it's so addictive. But at the same time, you know, you, when you're working for yourself, as you know, mm -hmm. you have to prioritize your time. No one is there to manage your time. So m my theory is that the more time I spend doing jiu-jitsu is the less time I'm I'm practicing yoga. Mm -hmm. And and I realized that I have so much to learn in yoga now that you have to make sacrifices. And I think that, um, that uh, you know, I, I often do things now to think how will it complement my yoga practice. And what I mean is, so for example, this morning I was doing deadlifts because in yoga you don't pull at all. Mm -hmm. And um, you do a lot of stretching the hamstrings, but you don't, like um stretch them under weight really and um so that's that's what i do and i've got that in my mind and i think it's because i just want to get better at my craft i want to get better at something i'm doing and be more knowledgeable and find balance in my body um have you have you seen like what would be 
because it seems like when I looked on your Instagram, it's everything is programmed very carefully. Have you got a certain schedule that you stick to every week in terms of one day's pulling, one day's pushing, one mm-hmm. day's gymnastics? Have you got something like that? Yeah. For you? Um, oh, sorry. I'd say we loosely follow conjugate programming. Um, what, what's in that? that? Conjugate programming would be the old school Russian, Russian style of working things concurrently. Um, and so on like a Monday, we'll lift heavy typically and then do some accessory stuff around that. So that could be a squat in a cycle. It could be deadlift in a cycle or whatever. Um, I'll go straight to Wednesday and say that Wednesday's our upper body day. So that's our push-pull day with accessories again. So a relatively heavy day. So you have Monday lower body heavy, Wednesday upper body heavy. Then on Friday, what would typically be a dynamic day um, for the conjugate stuff, we've turned it to hip day, which is hip mobility. Um, that's why I say loosely following, following conjugate stuff is like, it's just a different intensity. So it's not max, max. It's max and then something slightly less intense or different. Um, and then on Saturday, we've straight arm strong, which is the second upper body day, which is again, another, it's actually quite a heavy day anyway, but it's a different style of upper body to Wednesday's class. Mm. So we have lower upper, lower upper during the week. Those are the main things that stay kind of programmed as such. Tuesdays we've handstands. So after a heavy Monday, it's a drop in intensity. It's skill-based, easy to come to. There's coffee, you know, the whole shebang. It's really <laughs> just nice. Uh, Thursday is our main kind of cardio class or our conditioning class, um, which is the kickbox style class, don't get hit, which is a play on words. <laughs> don't get high intensity interval training. Oh, nice. um, just because one of those things that's overdone in the fitness industry. And so people think it is high intensity interval training, but really we're actually, we're looking for most of the time an aerobic steady you know, you can manage this for 40 minutes style thing. So anyway, uh, and then handstands on Saturday after the upper body class. So there's, you know, a solid program there where if someone's coming for a trial week, I'll say to them, come Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Those are the pillars of the program. And then whatever suit floats your boat or sparks your curiosity in between that as your fourth class, try that. Right. And then see. we'll get to see the person in what we feel are really easy classes as a template to see them moving and then guide them gently into the principles of what work looks like and feels like. Uh, where are you on your chin up path and what, what direction would you like to go so we can tell you what you need to do and where you're at and give you a timeline for what you'd like to do um yeah so i think having having that as a because again it's only ever a framework as well right everything that happens in person whether it's mood whether it's you know just energy levels whether it's uh injury or niggles or whatever it may be um those are all the, the stuff that needs to be worked out in person so having a framework is important mm-hmm. having a program that makes sense and kind of you know goes through little cycles of four to eight to twelve weeks or whatever it may be mm-hmm. um it's nice because it's not overly complicated um and it, yeah it just it gives us everything we need and, and the members thrive on it so which is the main thing obviously yeah i think it seems I, I could be wrong but just the impression i get is that the handstand seems very popular yeah is that right with that um, am i like because to me it seems like something that people um it seems quite elusive you know the handstand mm-hmm. is that is it quite popular at your studio the handstand yeah, coffee thing? yeah i think uh, because of CrossFit and, and the Edo Portal kind of five years ago-ish, the handstands became much more popular. Um, and it's just one of those things that we were doing like 10 years ago, my friend and I, Phil. Um, we are always just playing around with handstands. And then I went to, I think it was Edo Portal's thing actually in Copenhagen, which was six years ago maybe. Yeah. Um, with a couple of friends, I learned a couple of things and that turned my handstand practice from just playing around with it to learning, oh wow, there's a way to actually do this. Mm. And I got my handstand like 57 seconds I think within a month after that because I think I knew exactly what to do uh, and from there I went to Yuval Island's workshop and just started to travel to learn from handstand teachers um, mm. which is cool but yeah I think handstand's super enjoyable um, for us it's been weird right because like we want to help people kind of from the ground upwards um, so that's why we train barefoot and you know all this sort of stuff and the handstand literally flips it on its head but it gives you a chance to talk about graceful uh, movement uh, finding your centre balance or your centre mass over your base mm-hmm. of support and all the things that aren't really sexy to do on your feet the handstand really makes it accessible so you really get to slow people mm-hmm. down and actually work on how the person's moving uh, encouraging somebody not to make noise when they're you know entering the, the handstand on the floor so which takes strength and grace and um precision and you know we have to be connected to what you're doing as well you can't just get away with being like uh, yeah it's true isn't it yeah. yeah so it's a nice place for for the person to be for 90 minutes or two hours it's just that yeah you can't it, which brings its own frustration obviously as well but you can't not be present because you'll be on your arse <laughs> quite yeah. quick yeah absolutely yeah that's so true isn't it you have to be present when you're because mm-hmm. if you do concentration goes for a moment you go down mm-hmm. <laughs> you know there's dire consequences um maybe but um <laughs> Actually, it's interesting what you said about feet because 
I in the gym today. I was wearing my Vivo five finger. Saw that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I've got a few pairs of them. I've got uh, not vi- so not um, Vibram, yeah, Vibram, Vibram, Vibram yeah. yeah. But then I've got Vivo as well. I've got a few pairs of Vivo. Those these are all barefoot shoes, and I have realised that squatting I find very difficult because I'm I'm sure it's because of my ankles. Like I find dorsiflexion quite difficult. But this is this is something that. I just general hip mobility is something that I've just neglected all my life because I've done very linear movements, okay. football, you know, running, cycling, that type of thing. And we listened to Tony Riddle and I had this idea before about the ground living, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> like living without, when I moved in here to this place, I said to, I said to my mum, I was like, you know, my mum was here when I was moving in and I said, I'm, uh, I'm not going to have furniture in my new house. Mm-hmm. she said what you know like, what are people going to sit on i says no you should sit on the floor and, and stuff like this are you do you subscribe to any of that kind of when you sit like i'm surprised you're not like sitting in you're not squatting now you know yeah. <laughs> well there are a couple of things so uh tony's a friend obviously uh, we know each other i think it was our seven year anniversary of meeting two weeks ago oh um, you, you know each other like oh yeah, yeah yeah tony's a friend oh, oh, right. I, thought, I thought you knew that sorry no yeah. i didn't I, I didn't know okay so we'll talk about tony real quick then um this pops up invariably in every podcast, but generally or I went from being a person who qualified as a personal trainer to then being in a situation where I realized I didn't know as much as I should know. Now it was super early in my personal training career as such. But um, anyway, there was a moment where one other trainer who had qualified recently as well knew a couple of things that I didn't to help somebody. I was like, how do you know that? And I don't. Well, he's like, well, I learned here, which is now Elite Academy, Elite um, Fitness Performance Academy. Yeah. Uh, Sean McGarry and Jason Kane. Um, I was like, well, um, like the per- the place I qualified obviously is you know not as good as where you qualified, um, which will remain nameless, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I searched them out and I had a look, and as it turned out, they had a workshop on the next week or two weeks afterwards. So I went out, met Sean. Oh, what about you? Uh, you know, so sold me straight away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we met Sean. I yeah, know. I've seen it, I've seen him on Facebook. He's got yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, Celloy's to an Eskimo. He's, <laughs> he's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, anyway, so it turned out that it was the Fundamentals of Human Movement to workshop with Tony Riddle and Ben Meadow that was coming up. I was like, whatever it is, I'm, I'm with it. Like, you know, just super green, and, but super keen to learn and really humbled by any situation that made me feel like I wasn't, you know, the, the person doing that could help people. Yeah. Um, so anyway, went, no money, <laughs> as was the way for the first five odd years in business. I was like, I've no money, but sure, look, go on. <laughs> uh, signed up for it. And then, yeah, just went and had my mind blown because Tony pretty much introduced me to barefoot running. So they were analyzing barefoot running technique and talking about all the stuff that he was talking about recently on Rich Roll's podcast. Uh, and then just, yeah, fundamentals of human movement from uh, fighting or defending, uh, running, catching, you know, balance, just all the things that make us human, locomotion, whatever it may be. Um, and that workshop really changed everything because I, I came from a place where it was real sets and reps and machines. You know, you learn how to mm-hmm. peck deck and all this <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to being able to use your human body, though, like you don't you don't need too much external stuff. And I know progressive overload is obviously super important, but there are so many fundamental human things that we should all be able to do before we even worry about doing weights. And uh, I don't mean that in a romantic way. The way Portal was saying, like you know, you, you need to master your body before you you know the self dominance thing before you start looking at external objects. I don't think that's true because you know external objects are part of our life and we need to be able to move things obviously um but just realizing and bring, breaking it back down to the bare essentials literally uh it just blew my mind um mm. everything from like ben meadow was teaching us kind of parkour vaults and all this sort of stuff and we went out and jumping from just real primal stuff like mm. um and so yeah that that's from that moment forward i was like right okay cool i'm pretty much a movement person now mm. this is the person i want to be yeah, I can't. I can't see myself as just being a sets and reps personal trainer with just stupid machines and all that, which I wasn't doing anyway. But uh, and I think everything since then has just been becoming that person more and more and more, and finding my own voice and my own way of doing things and making sense of things myself and my way. And you know, taking some of what Tony's talked about, but then taking some of what Ido talked about, and you know, sometimes expressive, sometimes really fundamental, uh, sometimes emotional, sometimes community based, and you know, mm-hmm. just creating this whole thing. I've always felt like it was our own philosophy of things about doing things, and. I think I've always tried to pay it forward by saying, okay, well, this is what I believe in. I still need to work in it. And listen, you know yourself. Like, There's not a day that I don't drive around and listen to a podcast. There's not a minute I don't spend learning about things. And, <laughs> you know, I'm still super passionate about everything. Mm. Um, but yeah, I've always got that, that I didn't want to be just fitness. I didn't want to be just a CrossFit gym. I didn't want to be just 
in the nicest way possible. I don't want to do anything that anybody else is doing. And if if it makes sense to do what other people are doing, grand, but I'll still have to make sure it has layers to it and, and all that. Um, joking about this earlier, but what was the question again? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, you were, we were talking about, yeah, just about kind of... No, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me, no, me and Andy were joking for the podcast started that like, this is an interview and I, I when I've been on podcasts, I'll answer the question. Halfway through, I forget what the question was because <laughs> I go, but tangents are good. Yeah. Um, no, I mentioned about like natural living and natural being, but actually yes. you touched on something, you touched on something brilliant there, Andy, and that was about you don't want to be just one thing. Mm-hmm. You don't want to, you're, you're making your, your, your own thing, as it were, and fusing different things together and, and, you know, as you said, paying it forward. But, I feel the same way a bit like yoga. And I said to my girlfriend recently that I feel like yoga is the vehicle for me. Mm -hmm. And, but what I'm really like is bringing people together. And I like being part of something where I, there is a community and there is like, so I'm doing a retreat next month, uh, sorry, this month, September. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm doing a retreat in September. And I, it's the first time hosting a, a co hosting a retreat. And, you know, I'm doing more workshops going around the country, doing workshops. And I realized the buzz of actually bringing people together. And I now I want to do longer retreats and stuff. And it's more like that. And yoga happens to be what brings us together. Mm-hmm. And what I love about yoga is that I don't need external objects. Yes, I still do deadlifts and I use resistance uh, and progressive overload. Mm-hmm. But I, li- I like the idea of exploring your own natural movement and patterns that you maybe have just neglected all your life. And mm-hmm. I just find that interesting, and and uh, and also introducing an an element of play. Yeah, because I think that my sister was actually going to study play therapy. She's a social worker, Brilliant. and, and um, like there is a thing called play therapy. I mean, like to play is so important for us. And we, we when when we're young, I actually think this is why jujitsu is is quite so popular because when we're young kids will ne- actually wrestle. I know I used to you wrestle, mm. you know, with my poor sister, but like, cause I didn't have a brother. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know, you'll see a couple of like puppies will do it as well and actually wrestle. And then when parents will say, mm. get down off of that uh, monkey bar or stop wrestling your brother or your sister. And we kind of lose that as adults then. And I, and I think that's why when I leave, say, jiu-jitsu, I feel high. Mm-hmm. I feel like, I'm like, I feel alive. And I think it's because... Um, you're exploring p- p- primal movement patterns, maybe. Mm-hmm. Now, often I went on about about three tangents there. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, so what what do you see to be? Because gyms can be quite lonely places. I'm not saying your place isn't a gym. This is the difference I'm making. People sign up for the year January. Mm-hmm. Right, this is it. I'm going to get my six pack for the summer or whatever it may be. They go for a couple of months and they realise that. They go in, maybe the trainer will be like, give us another plank. Because I worked in a gym before with mm-hmm. personal trainers. Give us another plank and, you know, you can do two more. And it's like almost like a punishment. Mm-hmm. Like I was naughty over Christmas. I ate loads of stuff I shouldn't eat. And now I'm going to punish myself so that for a wedding or my two weeks in Lanzarote, I can look a certain way. So those pictures will go on Instagram mm-hmm. and people will think I'm like this. And this thing of this loop of eating poorly and then punishing yourself in a gym i think that's destructive mm. and i think people can sometimes if they don't have a personal trainer they go into a gym they go they do their sets the reps and they think what, what am i doing this for whereas i make an assumption here it seems like the movement studio there's i because i look, look at your instagram stories and from what sue said as well and other people i know that go to the movement studio there's that that sense of community um so uh, have I am I off off here? No, this? you're bang on the button. Um, so uh, again, this is why I almost wanted to com- go completely away from fitness industry and almost I, I, I don't want to say marketing because marketing is just storytelling. But in our storytelling, we're trying to be somewhat anti-fitness or anti-fitness industry to separate ourselves and say there's a different way. And what I mean by there being a different way is just change the narrative. So we don't do fat loss programs. We don't pretty much talk about fat loss. We don't like there's a way in scales tucked away in the corner it's mostly for me um but we don't weigh people in we don't do all that um so going back to play as well tony has a lovely phrase of uh, biologically normal or socially extreme or socially normal and biologically extreme so we shouldn't need play therapy now you know we just need play mm. you know so 
like you're saying about kind of losing it because parents say get down from things or uh, it's taboo to touch or hug in the workplace or whatever it may be you know uh, that's why you need therapy because you're missing your fundamental human needs which are physical social emotional yeah. and so by interacting by you know just even wrestling or sparring you know tigers and cubs and all that do it um all that sort of stuff makes us well and if you think about it the body senses threat or safety that's the general thing we'll talk to somebody about in a trial week or whatever it's like and stress is stress it doesn't matter what the stressor is the body registers stress so if we're missing that in a play context or in a relationship context you know with a um whatever it may be just everything from from a friendship to to being with your partner to whatever it is if you're missing touch you're missing one of your major human needs you're not getting the the stimulation for uh the hormone release and you know all these sort of things so the things that make us well are the things that are innately human about us um so back to back to that we shouldn't need play therapy if we have play we're fine um and interaction and touch and all that sort of stuff so yeah so when when we get back to that then about changing the narrative about kind of what makes us well and, and being anti-gym or anti-fitness industry or at least the toxic side of the fitness industry we promote communication uh, we promote touch obviously contextual to you know every, everybody has their personal space and we'll, we'll say that as well it's like be super respectful and communicate well if this next drill involves touching or applying pressure or whatever it may be or interacting and sometimes you won't sometimes you'll be like this is the game off you go because it's just hands touching uh, but I think you can only kind of be the change you want to see and you have to be it you don't you can't just keep talking about it or or you know bringing up fat loss and then saying yeah we'll do this but then we'll do something different just if it's not important to you don't do it so by, by not even have a fat, lo- fat loss narrative um, we're just changing it we're changing the whole subject and then therefore we're changing how people view the gym inverted commas into a studio because a studio is a place where art is done and there's an art to living your life well there's an art to coaching there's an art to using your body there's an art to all these things um, which is super different to punishment you know mm-hmm. uh, and while I think those cycles are subjective and I think we can all go through them because we all want to look well we all want to feel well and that's subjective as well Um. But then there are also health markers that would dictate if you're a certain, you know, body fat percentage, if your hormone profile and all that sort of stuff um, is of a certain kind, you're you're more likely to be more healthy. But then equally, if you're fulfilled emotionally, you know, you're going to be more well. If you've less stressors, you're going to be more well and all that. Um, mm-hmm. So I think the main thing for us is coming from that standpoint of like, there's certain things we don't want to talk about. If someone comes in, they want to lose weight we will absolutely do it we have a nutrition coach martina um who does the mum and babies class and then i'll say like okay this is separate to the membership and it's on a one-to-one basis which means you're working directly with the person you'll have your check-ins and it'll be all super tailored to what you do um but as a whole like you know we understand that some people need to get their their eating dialed in and the stress levels dialed in because it's just education at the end of the day mm-hmm. i don't do the nutrition stuff i find it super taxing because a lot of it is layers of emotion and connection to food and you know, mm. there's a lot behind it, basically. I don't think it's as simple as saying, eat this, don't eat that. Um, and so with that said, I think I'm in a much better place to help change those things by highlighting the physical, social, emotional stuff in class and having those conversations and doing it a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've had people lose tremendous amounts of weight just off doing that. And so therefore, like not having to talk about it, realizing that there's a different way because the thing that's would seem most obvious, food is not really the thing. No. If you can get rid of the stressors and get people in love with themselves and, you know, get people enjoying what they do mm-hmm. and loving training, if you start to enjoy turning up to the gym, you're like, I'm actually looking forward to training today. Cool. And you're still going to burn the same calories you burnt. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? That, so that's so change it. That's so interesting because essentially what you're saying, do you want more water? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, go Distilled water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's interesting because I think, so people are coming, they have a community there. As you said, it's it's more like the people studio. And when people, I think, start to move and, and learn how to move first, because sometimes when you're, you're a physical person, so am I, like I have to, every day, I have to move at least twice, like two sessions, or okay. one, once a year, like I have to, and um, sorry, I mean, at least once, sometimes twice, that's what I'm saying, to move. Hmm. And I like to change our movement. So it's, it really affects how I feel. But some people, you forget, they, just, they don't know yet. They don't know how to move the body safely. And, and, uh, and it's our job to help them to find what feels good for them, right? And then maybe once they're moving well and they're thinking, oh, I like this new studio I'm going to, I might start going here instead of going to the pub or whatever mm-hmm. it may be. You don't, you, know, you can do both, obviously. <laughs> and then maybe from there, because they've started to learn how to move, then they start thinking, if I eat better, I'll feel better and I'll, I'll move better, perhaps. Because as you said, 
addressing the food thing is is complicated. Like I was a personal trainer before I became a yoga teacher, and uh, I would go through food diaries, and I say, okay, John, why did you eat those don't donuts? Do you remember when we <laughs> talked about the donuts not being good? Step back, John. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but um, you know, and then it would be a case of oh, I didn't have time to cook and. And you think you know, and they know there's something something below that. And I think that, um, I mean, I see it in yoga as well. With the whole like yoga for a hot body, or you know, mm-hmm. like get a six pack, or was it yoga burn? This type of thing, and they'll yeah, have yeah. a picture of someone with a six pack or um, some athletic looking lady, and uh, you're essentially they're trying to trying to tap into people's insecurities, aren't mm-hmm. they? And that's and that's motivating them from a, a narrative that's quite destructive. Yep. Um, because ultimately there's always going to be someone who's going to look better, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, in that respect. Um, have you, when you, with people that come to a studio, are, are there like athletes that come and then like house, I don't say, I don't say housewives, that sounds sexist, <laughs> but house husbands and housewives? <laughs> yes. Is it all kind of profile? Yeah, so uh, when you said that, it made me think about like, it gets to a point where you're fueling your performance and then it was... To me, like we're not a strength and performance gym. We don't train people for competition. Um, the performance thing is cool, but we're more of a lifestyle gym. Um, mm. And so by being a lifestyle gym, we really get to embrace beginners. And so with that said, we have people from all shapes and sizes. Our teens class, 14-year-olds, uh, all the way up to Adelaide, who is 70. Um, wow. And so we have a real mixed bag of people. Um, and again, once we have a framework to be able to talk to people and train them as, as they need, it's grand. Uh, so yeah, we are definitely a lifestyle studio and not so much about performance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I was chatting to this about one of the trainers who kind of was a member and now became a coach and she's, kinda, she's going to travel a little bit and hopefully she'll come back as a coach. I think the, the natural thing would be that if someone gets to a certain point in their life, maybe they'll want to go and do other things. Um, and so I view our, the studio is always a platform. It's a platform for a member to become a coach to, to do that if they want to. Uh, it's a platform for a person who's afraid to go to a gym, to come to here and then, you know, start to love their own body and how they move and all that. Um, it's a platform for conversation. It's a platform for all that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it really depends what each person wants to do, but my job is to just provide that. And if it means they stay, great. And if it means they go onto bigger and better things, great as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but definitely, definitely looking at things from a health perspective not necessarily just a strength and conditioning or a strength and performance thing Mm -hmm. and i think that does separate us because again you're talking about looking externally of kind of people looking at fat loss and yoga shreds and all this shit (laughs) um but it just means they're still looking externally and so our health is going to come from a place where we start to look internally and start to you know think about things internally i know for myself like whenever i had an external focus on things that was when i was unhappiest and now that I can look at myself and look within myself and, you know, have self-esteem and, you know, know my place and know my social status uh, in a nice way, which which just means for me, by the way, I have my place amongst my people. I don't feel like I'm above anybody or and I absolutely don't feel below anybody. I'm just with my friends and my people. Um, yeah, just stuff mm. like that. Just, again, embracing what makes us human. We're not, and we'll say this in a trial week as well. It's like you're not looking to break any records this week. You know, we're just getting to know you and little did I realize that like it's always going to be like that you're trying to better yourself each week mm. but you're not here to be better than the person beside you necessarily unless it's in a view to be like oh i can do this now let me help you like you know mm. br- bringing the whole the whole room up or raising the standard um again back to changing the narrative mm. so i just mm. think it's so important and just living it as a lifestyle i think that's just the main thing and do you do you do anything else and like you have the studio where you have your events and you know you do your classes but do you do stuff outside that do you do like the movement studio retreats or anything like that i haven't yet um i think i've always wanted to dial in what we do in the studio better and i think we're at a stage now where like i think we generally kind of do level up each year like we've expanded most of the the years we've been there every year um i think this year we refined business systems a lot more the general experience uh we have a few more things to do mm. um yeah a couple of classes to add and a couple of different style of things to do um but yeah i'm really excited for the next phase then because i think we'll take a couple of more coaches on board hopefully um w- yeah one maybe two um and then again that'll be a platform for them you know to to grow into that space i'll get a bit more space to run the business and then see what's next and um, so in terms of external things i think 
we'd be jumping the gun a bit in terms of going away from the studio to do other things when actually the studio still needed a bit of nurturing. Mm. And I mentioned it to the lads group about two months ago about doing it. Uh, so maybe next year. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, other than that, no, like if we get invited to, to wellness festivals or, you know, to do stuff like that, generally the answer will be yes. Mm-hmm. Um. And then in most recent times, actually, the answer has been no, because we've just been focusing on what we do and yeah. all that sort of stuff. I just think that's where I have the most impact of like, if we can get this right and the coaches then become somebody who can spread that message and then maybe I can go off and spread the message after that. But mm. I think really refining who we are, which which we, re- we rebranded as the Movement Studio just under a year ago. It was AM Fitness before that. And mm-hmm. so, so that's been a transition just to really be like, okay, this is absolutely who we are um, and just keep refining it pretty much as a brand as well which you know is is a nice thing because your brand is just your promise you know so right. just just saying who we are and, and be yeah. really solid about your it. brand is your promise that you just said yeah that's come from seth golden who i absolutely oh, I, I love adore. seth golden yeah. yeah um he has like the mo- most read blog in the world i believe okay yeah so, i believe it oh yeah he sends out an email every, every day, day. <laughs> crazy yeah. um sorry you were saying about rebranding it being your being your promise yeah um it's very interesting actually to talk about that because I remember when I first heard about AM Fitness, I thought, oh, it's morning fitness. I thought it was AM. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> I know, sorry, but like, so that's, that's what I thought. So it was, it, it's, it sounds, the movement studio is just, it can't, like, it's so straightforward, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and brand is actually something that, um, just on the topic of Seth going on, I saying this to my girlfriend that she's, um, now talking about you know how to do our website and because she's a massage therapist Mm -hmm. she's doing reflexology as well and she just started never worked for herself before so this is the first time and she sees me talking about i i will say the word brand and when i use the word brand i kind of cringe slightly because it makes me feel like um someone in a boardroom but i like the way you said brand your brand is your promise because i think that it's how you if you, 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 I view myself as a, a teacher, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, like, th- therefore your brand is how you communicate, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, what else does Seth Godin say that's good about brands? Well, I, I love him. I love all this stuff. Yeah. No, I just, <laughs> I mean, I think when I got into, my brother had set up a company probably, yeah, it would have been over 10 years ago now. Um, and I was kind of in between things, like, you know, left the family business, wasn't sure what I wanted to do and all this sort of stuff. I ended up helping him out a little bit. And within that, I had no experience in this, but I started to kind of help him grow his brand with stuff like um, putting together like little video files for Bluetooth technology stuff. To, it never really kicked off, but anyway. Um, but back then when I was looking at, well, how do I learn this stuff and how do I help him? Yeah. Um, it ended up paying huge dividends for me. I found Seth Golden and I started reading his books, Purple Cow and all that. Mm. Um, and then like 10 years later, I'm just heavily back on Seth Golden stuff. Like just driving around, listening to his podcast and listening to him sp- share his wisdom. But the thing I love about him is like marketing is not the devil. Branding is not the devil. He's like marketing is pretty much communication, like telling your story. And one of the beautiful things he says is mm. like marketing in a nutshell I think it's seven words <laughs> uh, he's like <laughs> people like us do things like this I'm like cool mm-hmm. super simple um and then he's like yeah when it came to a brand he's like your brand is your promise so when you go to nike you know what you're getting you absolutely know what quality it's going to be what the experience is going to feel like you go to your favorite restaurant you know it. so so your brand is not like shallow kind of images and all this it's your promise and you have to live up to it every time and uh, same way that marketing is marketing is storytelling, which makes our Instagram super easy to do. And that's why people always come in and say, well, it's exactly how you look at Instagram. I was like, yes. of course it is. We're honestly telling our story. Yeah, yeah. And so why would it be any other way? You know, I have a huge, because you mentioned earlier about kind of toxic marketing, a uh, real emotionally driven ad copy, making people feel shit about themselves to come and join the class and then perpetuating that cycle of, you know, bleh. and again, being, being the change we want to see, we just honestly say what we're doing each day. And this is the lifestyle we live because people like us do things like this. Mm. And so you know exactly what to expect. And hopefully if you've had a good experience here, you can now bring that to what you do. Um, you know, so maybe in your yoga class, if someone's coming in looking for a six pack, you'd be like, actually, <laughs> we can do it differently. <laughs> um, but, but you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. so yeah, just being, being on the ball with this is who we are as a brand, which means this is our promise, which means this is your experience when you come here. And if the story on Instagram looks like what you're looking for, we're your people. But I love what you said there. It's storytelling, isn't it? That's mm-hmm. what marketing is. Yeah. And we, we hear the word marketing again, we, we, we kind of get, especially in the yoga world, you think, oh no, that's, that's distasteful. But you got to tell your story yeah. and and actually telling st- storytelling is a lost art it's a skill that we mm-hmm. we lose now because we 
we're just communication is becoming more fragmented as it, as is our attention but if you can like if i see um someone's instagram and it has a certain theme to it or every t- like you for example you're the same now as you are on instagram mm. exact same the way you speak and everything but it, on the flip side of that if i seen someone who was putting on a show uh, it would put me off because oh. I think sometimes we really underestimate how intuitive we are as humans. And you can, uh, and when you use things like Instagram, you are, it's, that's your shop front, that's your shop window. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking, walking past a shop and everything looks nicely organized and well merchandised and, you know, the nice colors being used, there's a bit of thought put out, you're more likely to go into that than a shop that looks a complete mess. Um, you know, and I think that's, that is why it's um, when you're talking about creating community as well. Instagram is kind of Instagram website because we've got a really nice website as well. The colours that it all matches. Um, you're creating experience, and that just becomes an extension of the studio, mm-hmm. doesn't it? And it's the kind of and and I, th- I would say uh, I imagine that as well for your type of business that or um, yeah your venture that th- it helps to get people to meet each other maybe like people see share things on instagram with each other they take videos of each other and they tag each other and it mm. it kind of helps to be a social lubricant nice. <laughs> <laughs> um but um oh oopsie daisy yeah me? Oh. okay no, that's me um but speaking of branding <laughs> and speaking of like marketing you've got a, you've got a podcast now mm-hmm. and you've done a couple of episodes yeah what's what's the why why, why movement? <laughs> why podcast? Why podcast? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, yeah, it kind of fits it. It fits into brand. Um, a conversation with one of the one of the good friends of mine actually. It's a podcast who came out yesterday. It's not in that conversation. But we were just talking about kind of. It wasn't necessarily growing the brand, but he felt that there was something there that he could start to kind of move into a little bit more. He was like, "I've done this. Uh, don't be mad at me. I'm not stealing anything." But like. Do you mind if I continue to do this? And I was like, it got me thinking about, okay, Grant, it doesn't really have to involve me, but if you're going to do it, do this way. And then that became, sorry for being cryptic, but uh, that okay. became like, actually, no, we need to have a Skype. Like he's not in the country at the moment. It's like we have to have a Skype and we have to have a chat. And the next conversation be like, yeah, but if we do that, we need to do this. And if we do that, it ended up coming all the way around to, to, to something that's kind of dear and dear to my heart because of another member and a good friend in the studio as well who works with homelessness. Um, and the long and short story basically is like the way he's trying to work with homelessness in this country is kind of handcuffed by the government and by systems and by you know funding and by all the bullshit that goes on basically. And you don't help a homeless person by donating a sleeping bag. They're already homelessness and homelessness doesn't start by that. Homelessness starts from trauma, young typically, you know, whatever it may be. And so how do we then have a change on the culture around homelessness or stopping people becoming homeless? So you get it at the roots. And the general gist of kind of where we're trying to go with the brand a little bit more with the podcast is by highlighting all the things we have in common, all the things we struggle with, all our little stories and all that sort of stuff that make us unique, but realizing that actually we all suffer from the same things, we all need the same things, and that if we can start highlighting these things, like um, even something as simple as your parents telling you they're proud of you, we don't hear that from our generation. You know, uh, human touch, again, we don't necessarily get the hand on the shoulder, well done son, or whatever it may be. Uh, we don't get men talking about their feelings. Stuff like that's been highlighted, but Jody Kennedy's doing great work there, you're doing great work, everybody's starting to talk about it more. Um, all these things that, they're basically the things that make us suffer are the things that we need to highlight a bit more to realise we all have it in common. So if we go into a shared space there, be like, cool, nice podcast man, the other day, like I didn't realise you were going through that. Actually, I have this story from 10 years ago myself and that, and it just opens it up. Mm. And so if you can open up those channels for people to talk about that stuff, then we can slowly start to kind of, even if trauma happens, we can ho- hopefully dissipate it a bit more, mm-hmm. which, would, which would be the thing that stops to make stops making the person be afraid to be in a home. Because that's what homelessness is. The person is afraid to be through the threshold of the door in a home. You know, because there's situations in homelessness where there's homes available and the person does not want it because home is just the threat. That's, that's generally what, what can happen. Like, yeah, so my friend who works in the homelessness, he's like, we have a house for this person who's been on the streets for 60 years. And he's like, no, I'm all right, thanks. I would rather be outside in the cold 
because it's too scary to be in a house. That's the level of kind of trauma you're working with. Wow. So this is just true conversations with him yeah. over the last couple of years. Yeah, so yeah. I'm like, okay, so if we're going to stand for something, because I can't really do things for money, and so I have to grow a business, but I can only do it with something in mind. I don't care about money so much. I like buying things and, you know, stuff like that. But again, I'll be buying things so that the, the experience is nice, you know, generally for, for more people than me. Um, and so, yeah, so for to try and change the culture again, to be the change to see, can we at least start to shine a light on things and realise that we're all the same? We all struggle with things. We've all lost people. We've all have somebody who's either attempted suicide or someone who's lost somebody to suicide. Again, don't need to be at a house. It's too late. They're gone. Do you know what I mean? So so trying to get to the roots um, through that conversation with my friend, which became from merchandise all the way down to like, you know, well, fuck it, let's try and end homelessness. <laughs> <laughs> So the podcast is actually that. It's talking to normal, inverted commas, people. Um, you know, not teachers, not anybody. It's just It happens to be teachers at the moment for the most part because they're the people who are a little bit more used to talking on camera. Um, but we've already got people who aren't teachers um, done and lined up. Um, yeah, just, just starting to shed a bit of light on what makes us human and what makes us thrive and just kind of... So, yeah. so the people that you got, you've got lined up, are they people that are sleeping rough? No, 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 no. So they're, they're all friends or people I know through the studio who oh. are invariably friends. Um, no, so it's it's not about that. It's oh, but it's more so, sorry, it's more so like, say you speak to someone who is maybe in a good place now to realise that 10 years ago maybe they weren't. And yeah. That, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and, mm -hmm. and you know what? Maybe the person I'm speaking to hasn't had a tough situation. Maybe we'll talk about something else. Um, but there's just some, some people I know who like, when I joined the studio, uh, I had just lost my friend the year previous. I was in a shit place. Uh, the space was good for me, but but it's not about the studio, and it's a real clear distinction to try and make. The studio will obviously be talked about because the people are in the studio. Uh, they know me through the studio, but we're really trying to separate that. It's not a marketing podcast. It's not about growing the brand. It's really about growing that side of things so that we can actually start to, to just move towards a, a place that's more healthy for people as a community. Mm -hmm. um, dude, it's, it's upsetting. You know, you hear friends who, like one of the lads nearly committed suicide twice over the previous year and he said the only reason he didn't was because cause of the lads group we have like that's deep shit like you know what I mean um, and again because he had the lads group he had the support he knew that where, however bad things got it was never going to be that bad that he, he had us at least and then things flip and turn around so I just if you're going to do something like make it about people and make it about your community and do it honestly because there's so much contrived marketing when we were talking about Instagram of it's a really easy way to grow your gym now. Join our community. It's like, yeah, great. You want 150 freaking seven members. That's not community. It gets over a certain stage where you lose connection with people and it's just about having the numbers in and you barely know Mary. Mary just joined two months ago. It's like, oh, that's Mary. Well done, Mary. You know what I mean? That's not community. Community is, I would almost say it's a certain amount of people per coach or per person or, you know, you want that kind of mm -hmm. you don't want it to separate into different kind of factions and stuff like that mm -hmm. you want an actual community and this is kind of we talked about this of like what does scaling look like it's like I don't want to get that big I really don't so we need to find more ways of kind of bringing um, money in or being able to grow it in ways that make sense to the culture and to the community mm -hmm. rather than just being big so that it looks like um it's the same as fat loss, right? All these coaches now want to be like, I'm now a business coach. I make X amount of money. We have a successful gym of Verta Commerce. Depends what your definition of success is. And for mm -hmm. me, back to the social thing, um, it's like my social status will be defined by how good this circle of people is and how the quality of life um, of people is around that. Mm. And I think that's something I can control and I think that's where my passion lies. So. Right, that's brilliant, Andy, man. Mm -hmm. um, because I, when I first started teaching, I was very much thinking this is about me. You know, I used to go into class and be think of it like a performance and how if someone down the back was talking at the start of class, I would get annoyed because I'm like, no, I'm speaking now, so you have to listen to me. And that was born out of the fact that I was very insecure about what I was doing and I was very nervous. Mm -hmm. So I was already like... Um, feeling unsettled and then and then well, now that i'm at a stage where i'm competent i know what i'm doing um and i'm comfortable in teaching i realize that it's it is about the people that are coming because i'll say sometimes to the people as well i go like if you guys didn't come we wouldn't, we wouldn't have this class so it's really it's what you want tell me what you'd like to do next week or like if you have any ideas any feedback let me know and then i started to realize that 
how much time do I actually spend to actually speak to the person when they're speaking to me? When do I look them in the eye? Mm. So what I do now after every class is I stand outside the class and I thank each person as they leave. And I know it doesn't, it may seem like a small thing, but um, I, if someone speaks to me, I actually am right, right. I'm, I'm standing here in front of you. Mm. I'm not distracted about what's going on around me or putting stuff in my bag. I'm just looking at you and, and listening to you. And when I first started, I didn't do that at all. I was just like, one class, next class, next mm-hmm. class, going through it. And then I had a couple of people, like some one person said they don't take, they were in a bad car accident and they don't take any medication anymore because of yoga, you know, with their breathing and their, their back feels better. And I had a few of those things come up and I thought, and I come home to my girlfriend and say, you know, I had someone said this to me today. And I started thinking, oh, right. I just sound silly, but, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but um, then I started thinking them as, as like um you know as as people as individuals that have had certain things happen in their day or their week or in their life and that every what you say can really affect how they feel and sometimes uh, as you said mentioned that that person that chap um sometimes this is what they're they're not living for but it makes a huge difference to the quality of their life Mm. and and i think that if you're it's really important to remember the impact you have on people, the words you say, how you, you know, using touch if, it, if it's necessary, giving someone a hug if they feel like mm-hmm. they're looking like they need it. And, um, but that is something that can get a little bit lost, as you said, when you think about expanding or just uh, doing all the time, more classes, more people mm. um, can get a little bit lost. But, and I, I've watched this couple, your, your, both episodes of your podcast and uh, I like the way it's so natural. And I, and I think that's what podcasting does. It gives, obviously you've got a Kimbo, like the Seth Godin podcast where it's information, but other podcasts, maybe like the Moo Stew. Moo Stew podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the Moo Stew. Um, <laughs> well, well, like I like to listen to a podcast like that while I'm cooking dinner. Mm-hmm, me too. Just have it on the background and you have no obligation to and talk back you can just <laughs> you can just listen you know um what who so you've got more you've got more guests lined up is it, are you going to keep it video i think so um unless the feedback is bad <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think the sort of things that if somebody is watching or they just if they're cooking dinner but they turn to have a quick look and they can see the body language and i think little things like that are like it's as easy to do a video as it is to do audio obviously looking at the setup um <laughs> how dare you <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i think why not because yeah. i mean you can always stick on youtube in the background and just leave the audio part on and you know yeah if you're on wi-fi um yeah i think video yeah so i want i want to come down to the the movement studio but it turns out that you guys um do you not open on sunday no. You need a day of rest, which yeah. is fair enough. <laughs> which is fair enough. And Sunday is, is my, my day off. But um mm-hmm. but I would like to come to events. So do you this is your chance to <laughs> to, to give some events. Do you have any because Christmas is coming. Mm-hmm. So is there any events coming up that I need to be aware of? Um you probably teach at the same time as we teach. <laughs> <laughs> um Vincent's teaching a QDR workshop this Saturday and hands and coffee is every Saturday. QDR, uh, is that like uh, elbow, yeah, elbow, yeah. elbow leavers? Okay. Yeah, so coming from a, a well, capoeira, but also a dance uh, background as well. So he's doing it during the straight arm strong class. So the the narrative will be strength, but then it'll be kind of moving and talking about how to do that as well. Mm-hmm. Just something different. I'm at a friend's wedding this week. Um, every Saturday, Hanson's Coffee is the one recommendation I'd say to people just because it's, it's, I'm not even going to say it's us at our best. It's just us at our most social. So it's like, you know, people who come in, we'll be meeting people for the first time as well. So newcomers come in and mm. um, it's a two hour class, which means you've loads of time. This is another thing about the, the industry of everything is kind of in and out. We've, we have time to sign people in, have a chat, make coffee, have coffee, have class, have a coffee during class, chat after, cl- you know, just super, super social nice. and take our time with the training and talk about why we're taking our time and, you know, don't be so intense with things. You have two hours of time on your wrists. Um, so that's one for everybody in general. Um, there's no big workshops coming up, mm. uh, but the coaches do things. So Vincent, uh, Vincent underscore VIS uh, on Instagram always has stuff going on. He does contemporary floor work classes in town. Um, 
Not at the moment, actually, mm. no. <laughs> but, okay. but the, so the, the thing we... Sorry, go on, you say. Oh, just in general, if anybody lives logistically, if they live close or work close, then, you know, always welcome for a trial week and that's... That is us at our best when we get to know you. Um, Terry, yeah, Terry Newell. Terry Newell, yes, sorry. Letting people know that's in South Dublin. Dublin 6 West. I'm in, <laughs> I'm in North Dublin. But um, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Andy, thanks so much, mate. If people want to find out more about you, where do they go? Instagram at themovementstudio.ie would be the best. Nice one. Thank okay. you very much as thank, well. Thank you. There we go. I hope that podcast, if nothing else, encouraged you to drink distilled water. <laughs> um, yeah, I sent the link to Andy of where I got my distillation machine. So maybe they'll be the next sponsor. Um, okay, so yeah, l- last thing before I let you go is workshop in December in Salt and Soul. That is handstands. going to be December 14th on a Saturday. Come down, make a weekend of it before you tuck into loads of Christmas pudding for the, in the following weeks. And... Uh, this Saturday, I've got the the event, the live podcast with Dan Morgan. It's a free event as well, so you can join the wait list and, as I said, we'll sneak you in. This podcast has been sponsored by Small Changes, organic, eco-certified store here based in Dublin, Ireland, but giving you whole food produce and goods and looking after the environment. So if you fancy getting down there to look after yourself and reduce your waste, you can check out smallchanges.ie. No, they, they don't have an online offering at the moment just go down there fully basket full of goodness um yeah thanks so much for listening if you enjoyed it please leave it with uh, leave a review on itunes and please take your tell your friends on your ig stories that makes a massive difference to me any questions about anything let me know feedback always welcome and appreciated hope you have a great week and i'll catch up with you next week